Before we start, we will ask people to put questions, to write questions on little papers. And we actually made some paper. Dan, could you show people the papers and pens? Uh, this is yours? Yes. There. So if you uh, want screen. to <laughs> ask a question to your audience, I would recommend you to write them on paper. And I will, uh, during the sessions, it's quite well. So we have pens and papers over there, so if you want to go grab them already now, you're most welcome. Uh, I'm sending here the win. Let's see if we can sort what the only way is. Should we start? Wait for at least for one minute more. Do you have time to wait for one minute, for maybe two? One minute. You're very, it's very tolerant. Well, this and yes, we lost. wants to go for a piece of paper, for a pen, or do you decide to wait very long? Oh. What is it? And is, uh, is there still people waiting to get inside, or should we start? Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Martin Q. Larsen. I'm a composer and musician, and I'm also the artistic director of the Nordic Music Days in South Bank Center in London. This is... Someone's talking behind me in the back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's ignore the people talking right by, behind my back. Andy... Uh, Oh, here's someone coming. Andy. No. Andy's helper. Damn lady. Mr. Helper, I don't know your name. 
There's some people speaking behind our backs. <laughs> the intercom is louder than we are. Could we stop that or raise their voices so we can hear what they say? There's some, sounds like someone is speaking suddenly. Somewhere here. <laughs> can you f make them stop? <laughs> Thank you. All right, I'll have a second go and try to speak louder than them and slower and in a better vocabulary. Uh, my name is Martin, I start from home. I'm uh, Martin Kularsson and I'm the artistic director of the Nordic Music Days. And it actually started some hours ago. Uh, we started with a workshop, with an ensemble, a secret <coughs> workshop, and then we had an open lecture here uh, two hours ago on young people and uh, children and composition. And uh, so this is actually the fourth activity of the festival, but it will not be uh, inaugurated until uh, 6.45 this afternoon with a premiere of a new fanfare that I am and another Martin go. But you are all extremely welcome to, to the uh, first seminar we have, the burning questions, uh, where we will discuss things that uh, in society and cultural politics that are important to composers and to the music societies. We want the Nordic Music Days not just to be uh, fireworks to contemporary Nordic music, but also to be a starting point for new collaborations between the music societies of the Nordic and British countries. And uh, the first panel, we will so we will do a sort of some collaborations with uh, British institutions and organizations. So this first thing is uh, co-hosted by Baska. We have the Baska staff, and we also have at least one Baska. Chair, director here, uh, Gary Carpenter, and we're happy to co collaborate with you. Today we're going to talk about gender equality and diversity in music. And we have some distinguished uh, uh, speakers from Sweden and uh, uh, UK. And we, they will give you everything there is to know. During, uh, we, will, we are very interested in the audience, what they think and don't think, uh, but in order to make this extremely effective, we will uh, ask you to write down all questions or comments that you have, and then give them to Andy. Stand up, Andy, so they can see you. Yeah. He looks at it. He's a very handsome man. Uh, Look, straight, look him straight in the eye and do like this, and he will come and collect your notes and give them all to me, and I will read them. Or, and we will see what happens. Uh, why are we doing this? Why are we spending 90 minutes on talking about these issues, and what do we wish to achieve? Uh, we will just keep that question in your minds because I don't want to ask them, I want them to answer it, I want you to answer this uh, question. Why are we here and what do we want to achieve during these 90 minutes and after these 90 minutes, preferably? We hope that society will still last. Uh, we will talk about, uh, we will give these six brilliant people uh, an opportunity to have each a short keynote speech uh, because we want uh, we want uh, to make room for more discussions. After the keynote speech, uh, there will be some discussions between the panels, and then we will let in some audience questions, and maybe everything will go around in a big hot pot of, of ideas and questions. And uh, we should not forget that this is not just about uh, middle-aged white man speaking, it is also about music. So I would like to uh, start this seminar with some music. Uh, could, uh, Sirius, this is uh, Sirius, and he will perform the first movement of a piece by Cornet.
let's make an exception. The first speaker of uh, today is uh, actually the, uh, the composer of this piece, Karin Rehnquist. She's an internationally renowned composer, just uh, recently worked with the Corona Sportet. She's a professor in composition at the Royal College of Music in Stockholm, and she is also the founder of the organization Kvast. Karin Rehnquist. Yes. I think I have to move. I can turn it off. Yes, I have been into contemporary music since the beginning of the 80s when I started to, to study uh, composition. And uh, um, since it, it has been waves of more women, less women, more women, less women. And then suddenly, when I scanned the, the general programs of the Stockholm orchestras 10 years ago, it was, they played zero women, it was zero, nothing. And actually, I got depressed. I went to bed for a week, and at the seventh day, I stood up and, said, and thought, they need help. And I think that's a very good uh, uh, key word. We, have, we need to help each other. It's not to, we need to help. They, they needed help. So out of that, we, we uh, met all women composers and started this Kvast, Kvinnlig Anbokning of Svenska Tonsvetta. It's very funny in Swedish, but in English it's just Women Association of Swedish Composers or something like that. But in Swedish, Kvast means also group. So, uh, and that's also a picture. And uh, what we did, we counted the, the programs of 15, 15 uh, orchestras, and out of, and then we wrote a letter to them. Okay, we have counted 15 orchestras, and out of 823 pieces, 813 are by men. Congratulations, all men. We are really happy and proud of all men, but maybe it's not uh, the year of 2008. So it was really, I mean, 1.20%. Uh, it was nothing. So we said, we can help you. We know a lot about women, and we can help you with repertoire. We have made a, a repertoire bank on the website, which is, uh, you can find historical uh, women composers and from all the world, not only our music, and that's very important. And, and that's. Um, that is uh, used a lot, actually. Um, and uh, we went to the program committees and discussed with them. In the beginning, it was really tense. But it has got uh, a lot. We found, a, a, I would say, a humorous way, a bit humor in, into it, not so aggressive, which, which has worked a lot. And we also made a prize, the golden broom which was a, a magnet, do you say magnet? Yeah. Magnet yes. on the refrigerator, <coughs> which you put, everyone who take a sandwich, kind of take a sandwich, you can think of that. I made something good for the women. Um, so uh, my, my, uh, no, uh, my advances when working with this, you should find the good bosses who cares about this, because if the boss doesn't care, nothing will happen. So, uh, and we have had some who really cared, and, uh, and you need some statistics, 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 statistics. Yeah. Uh, which makes things very clear, you need some humor, and, uh, uh, and maybe a, a, a prize also, which gets a lot of attention, and we've got a lot of attention, actually, because Zero is zero. It's very clear, and that, in that uh, respect, it was good that it was that bad. And now I, I say it's a, it's getting better, but still like this. But now it's an issue which you can talk about. Before it was a bit <laughs> oh, well, we <women. laughs> So now it's really an issue which we, every program group is talking about. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Corinne. Next speaker is Nicola Lefanu. Uh, Nicola is, has composed over 100 works which have been widely played, broadcast, and recorded. 
Uh, she has been commissioned by the BBC, by festivals in UK and beyond, and by leading orchestras, ensembles, and soloists. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, a one-minute history lesson, I think, to start. In this country, in 1912, a society of women musicians was founded. Their aims were to make sure that uh, it, the people who were studying at the conservatoires, which had been open, open to women for some time, a generation or more in this country, actually were represented in orchestras and musical organizations as players, conductors, and composers. That was 1912. And in 1972, they held a big concert here on the South Bank, music composed by women, played by women, conducted by women, to close the society because they had achieved their objectives. <laughs> <laughs> and those of us who had begun our careers in the 60s agreed with them because I and my colleagues, composers and performers, we felt we were having, we were, we were, we were having fantastic opportunities. Uh, go forward to 1987, we looked around, none of our students were getting the kind of opportunities we'd had. There was a kind of oligarchy, it was just, it, suddenly women's music had vanished from concert programs, and there hadn't been further progress in terms of conductors in classical music. So a group of us, men as well as women, <coughs> got together and we had a festival here called The Hidden Sounds. And I took three months off from composing and got all the st statistics together. It is a hard word, statistics. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and from the Arts Council, we're very unwilling to give them up, but I got them from the BBC and the other big players to show that suddenly women had just vanished. And we got the statistics into the Guardian, full page. And it took a lot of attention because they had a photograph there, big of me 20 years before. So that was quite useful because 20 years before, you know, Sort of <laughs> um, right. For about five years, our lobbying really bore fruit. It was terrific, and there was much more prominence for women conductors. Uh, Odelina Martinez conducting Smile at the Proms, for example. Um, many more commissions for women because certain arts organisations put money aside just for women. But it was a bit of a bandwagon, and what do bandwagons do? They roll by. So after about five years, things kind of reverted. OK, so what now, 21st century? Well, it's very interesting in this country. We have a, a wealth, a fantastic um, group of young and youngish composers who happen to be women who are very gifted and very successful. We also, and this is crucial, we have some very enlightened administrators who happen to be women. South Bank, Sound of Music, Forming Rights Society Foundation, Royal Philharmonic Society. These people make a difference. Most of my opportunities, in fact, have come about through an administrator or chief executive being a woman. So a lot of people say there's no problem anymore. Well, one should never use the word problem, I think, in referring to the wonderful music composed by women or other people excluded from that white man's club. Um, I think there is still a problem. Because otherwise, as Karen said, it's a cycle. Things are good for a decade, and they're bad for a decade. And we definitely have a role to make sure that we tackle the ignorance of the wonderful music that's out there. There is so much music that is not being played because it is not known by the people who program orchestras, broadcasting companies, maybe a string quartet, a big festival. Look through the programs, and as Pauline Onaviris once said to me, it's business as before. <laughs> uh, next one up is a man called Aaron Cassidy, who is professor in composition and director for the Center of Research in New Music at the University of Huddersfield. Oh, no, here we have the technical stuff. This is Aaron. Uh, and I'm, I'm an academic, so I, of course, have a PowerPoint. <laughs> um, but I pr it's statistics. Oh, wow. you can even pronounce it. So this past summer, I was appointed director of Siren M at the University of Huddersfield, uh, which includes overseeing the Huddersfield Contemporary Records CD label. And in one of my first responsibilities on the job, I was putting together an application. And as part of that process, we compiled some data about the label, including a listing of all of the composers represented on the label since its first release in 2010, which we color-coded by gender and nationality. 
Looking at that list, my instinctual response was that our gender balance was something that we should be proud of. So we put the data into a pie chart, which showed that we actually had very little to be proud of. Um, so um, I made an immediate decision to redress this imbalance, making a public commitment to achieve a 50-50 gender balance across all the composers represented on our label within five years, more on which in a moment. In the discussion about the disparity between my impression of the gender balance on our label and the cold, hard reality of the data, my colleague Lisa Lim pointed me towards a study from the Gina Davis Institute for Gender in Media. The study found that if as little as 17% of people in a crowd scene on TV are women, men see the gender balance as 50-50. If the scene shows 33% women, men perceive that as there being more women in the room than men. Which leads me to the first of three key issues that I'd like to propose for today's discussion. The first, solutions for addressing gender inequality in music need to be specific, targeted, and data-driven. The gender uh, perception gap identified in that study makes it clear that it's not sufficient to have a general sense that we're doing something to address inequality if it's possible to look at 17% and see 50. So we need numbers, we need targets, we need deadlines. And we need to make those targets public so our audiences and our communities can hold our feet to the fire. What this public commitment has meant in the case of HCR, the record label, is that we've had to make an immediate and significant change to our plans for future releases. If we're starting with a roughly 75-25 split, to achieve a 50-50 balance means fairly obviously that future releases need to be roughly 25-75. We've reworked some future projects, we've abandoned some projects, we've identified some, co some composers to work with who hadn't been part of our discussions before, and we've put extra resources behind projects that support our target. It has, in effect, provided opportunities that wouldn't have otherwise existed. And because time's tight, I'll introduce the other two issues quickly. A 2015 analysis revealed that despite an increase of 1,400% in applications to university music technology courses across the UK, 90% of those applicants were men. My, my colleague Liz Dobson, who's the founder of the Yorkshire Sound Women Network, has done some exceptionally interesting research about the kinds of methodologies, structures, and environments that are most conducive to establishing gender equality in music technology. In particular, her work has demonstrated that hands-on, collaborative, peer-assisted learning spaces are most effective. Direct tactile work with soldering irons, circuit boards, and noise-making devices provides a physical feedback that seems to enable a particularly strong and effective le level of empowerment and engagement. And I'm hoping I get to show you a little uh, video that proves that in a bit. Um, equally crucial, though, is targeted investment to support activity at the very highest level of professionalism in the field. We need to see strong, successful, influential female models in composition, like the ones on this panel, as widely and visibly as possible, and there needs to be targeted investment to increase the number of opportunities for women to rise to these positions. The data show that there's a precipitous drop-off in participation rates for women in composition across each level of study, from primary school all the way to, say, research professors at an institution like mine. This drop-off is a clear reflection of the historical gaps in the visibility of professional models for younger and emerging composers to emulate. When we're starting with a situation where our default image of a composer is often a marble bust of European male composer on the side of a building, the investment required to undercut that image is massive. It needs to be immediate and overwhelming. Incremental change is not enough. This is a place where targeted and well-funded affirmative action programs are crucial and where full commitment is needed from institutions with the power, visibility, and financial resources to effect change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And the next person up would be Christina Scharf, who also have. Do you have a PowerPoint? No. No? no. Okay. <coughs> PowerPoint free people. Uh, she, Christina, is a senior lecturer in cultural media and creative industries at King's College London. And she just released a book called uh, Great <laughs> Gender. Sorry. Gender. Called Gender, Subjectivity, and Cultural Work. Yes. Christina Scharf. Yeah. Um, hello. Thanks very much. Yes, I'm also an academic. I have not prepared a PowerPoint. <laughs> but interesting enough, my points are fairly similar to Aaron's um, in the sense, and also to actually Karen's and Nicholas. One thing I really want to highlight is the need for data collection and statistics. Um, and I'm going to come to that in a second. I do want to start, however, also with another point that's been made before, which relates to uh, the important issues of bringing inequalities on the agenda. 
something has happened, I think. Um, I agree with our spe previous speakers on that for the last two or three years. I believe um, inequalities in music, but also in other cultural areas, have come on the agenda a bit more. Uh, people have started to talk again about the lack of representation of women, of ethnic minorities, of people from working class backgrounds, not just in music, also in film. It comes up every year around the Oscar nominations and so on. So something has changed. But I think it's really important to maintain that conversation, not only because it highlights ongoing issues, but also because it really highlights that one very prevalent myth in the industries not just in music, but in the cultural industries at large, which is that all that matters is individual talent and merit, that that somehow doesn't hold true unless we believe that women, ethnic minorities, and so on are somewhat less talented than men, and we know that that's not the case. So I think it's really important to keep that conversation going, to highlight this issue, that merit is not the only thing that counts. We know from academic research it's about networking, it's about hanging out with each other, it's about um, having time, it's about financial resources to do a lot of the unpaid work, internships, and all that kind of stuff that gets you into the industries um, in the beginning and all that, all those things. Uh, the second point I want to make, as I foreshadowed just now, is the importance of data collection. Um, and I just wanted to show you my book. Um, I did collect some data. It includes very beautiful graphs. It's also based <laughs> on over 60 interviews with female musicians, including composers. Um, but it really came out of the need. I conducted the interviews and I realized uh, there, was a, there were issues around inequalities. I wasn't surprised because I have a PhD in German studies. Um, but then I realized there's no data and I was really surprised by that. So I went out with the help of course of PhD students who did paid work for me and we collected um, data on the representation of women in British orchestras, ethnic minorities in British orchestras, staff at conservatoires. I also looked at the admissions figures of the UK conservatoires, which are really interesting but very disheartening in terms of the um, admission of women and ethnic minorities. So all this data is in there. It's fairly recent, so it's worth a look. Um, data is really important because I think it also challenges another prevalent myth, which is that progress is somewhat linear. What we often hear when we talk to people about issues around inequalities is, oh yeah, but we've dealt with that in the 70s, right? And even if there's still some stuff remaining, change is going to happen. It somehow seems to happen automatically, gradually, and so on. And we know that that's not the case. We know that it goes up and down in waves, as Karen has mentioned. Um, and data really shows that. And data, somehow I managed to get on the radio once I had data. Nobody was interested in the 60 interviews or so I conducted. But once I could mention figures of 0.7% or whatever it was, um, I was hurt. But I think that's really important. Yeah, one minute. That's good. Um, I'm going to finish in the time. Um, the last point I want to mention in relation to data, I think it's important for the cultural sector, so let's call on many of you to also work with academics, um, not with me, there are many other brilliant people in academia, but to really uh, get to the core of issues, there's something you can get at when you have an outsider's perspective. So I often, perspective, I often see talks and debates about inequality issues, so I really welcome today's, which is very different because it draws on academics as well. But these talks tend to only be amongst industry members, and I think there's something really to be gained from speaking to people who study these industries, who have a wealth of knowledge, also from other industries and sectors and other disciplines, to understand this issue and get an outsider's perspective, because I think together we can really try to achieve something and change something. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And the next speaker, the penultimate speaker, is also a writer, Paula Wolf. She's an academic and also a songwriter, and she's author of the Women in the Studio, Creativity, Control, and Gender in Popular Music Sound Production. Paula, please. Hello, so I'm going to um, make some very similar points that have already been made this afternoon, but with specific <coughs> reference to popular music, uh, and in, in particular to the independent, the UK independent sector. So the children's laureate, Lauren Child, has recently vocalised fears that an overly prescriptive and goal-driven approach to educating young children is dangerously at odds with our need to be creative. She argues that often creativity is discovered by accident and that we need to make time for these accidents to happen. The time for my accident happened when I first went to university in 1983 to study English and Spanish and met some students in the first few days in my halls of residence who were rehearsing to form a band. 
It awakened in me the creative explosion of songwriting and it changed my life. That wouldn't have happened if I hadn't received a maintenance grant as a student from a low-income family to go to university. A few weeks ago, actor Tom Tim Roth made a similar point on Radio 4's front row with regards to acting when he commented that unless you can get some kind of grant to get into drama school, you're buggered. And so it would be rich people in the acting game unless you give poorer people an avenue, a doorway to step through. I form part of a generation of, work, of creators of working class origin who were the first in their families to go to university or drama school or art school and step through a doorway to experience the validation of our creative responses to the world. That sense of entitlement to create, in this case, music, is one that many people of privilege are imbued with from an early age, buoyed up by private music lessons and access to the arts, which can take many people of less privilege half a lifetime to achieve. My book is about creativity, control and gender in popular music sound production, set within a 15 year time period from 2002 to the time of writing. This is a period of time in which self-production by artists has moved from marginal to standard practice, a period in which women's underrepresentation as music producers has attracted attention and a period in which music production as an academic field has been established. My book argues the importance for female songwriters and composers to be in control of their own sound. But an artist's gender is not the only issue. In 2011, Andy Heath of the Beggars Group stated, I don't actually think there's a massive gender issue here. I think there's a massive social agenda, absolutely colossal. The absence of social diversity is absolutely terrifying. In 2017, a fragmented music industry reflects a fragmented <coughs> society and is characterized by contradiction. Society imposes expectations and holds up norms determined by gender, class, race and age. Success in the music industry can depend on how well an artist in particular conforms to those norms. Consequently, disparity exists between the work women do and the way they are received and represented. A lot of work has taken place to raise awareness of gender and diversity within the music industry's UK independent sector with AIMS, Women in Music and Entertainment events that have been running since 2007, a prime example. But this work takes place within a broader music industry culture that does not respond well to challenge. I suggest therefore, last sentence, that the situation of gender and diversity is positioned at a line of faltering progress whereby raised awareness remains at odds with prevailing values that result in marginalization. Thank you. Speaker is Isabel Thompson. She is the strategic strategic coordinator at the Swedish institution Musikverket, and she's working with gender integration and funding. Isabel, please. <coughs> you have a clicker. Thank you, Andy. Hello. Yeah, I'm going to have to fast forward through this. Uh, so Musikverket, <coughs> there's an English name for Musikverket. The Swedish Performing Arts Agency, and it's quite a new agency. It was incepted in 2011, and it has roughly two missions. One of them is to promote a wide-ranging musical offering throughout Sweden, and the other is to preserve and bring to life theatre, dance, and music heritage. So where I work, the, the, the department where I work, uh, is it, it's actually a funding body and we distribute about 2.5 million pounds a year, which is nothing really, uh, but to uh, collaborative music projects. And the, 
the, our main focus group is independent musicians and performers and project leaders, etc., who lead these projects. Uh, and the decisions <coughs> on funding are made by an artistic council uh, comprising uh, professionals that are both artists and uh, artistic directors. And it's quite a diverse panel of people, uh, seven people all in. And we have discovered that uh, independent music prof professionals uh, like to work internationally. By the way, we funded the, this festival Harvest yes, thank you very much. yes. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I I think uh, you need to know the background of the gender balance policy uh, that we have in our uh, agency. It it actually I mean gender but the balance uh, policy started in, in in Sweden. It became an area of government policy in the seventies, and the minister who is responsible for that is the Minister of Children, Elderly and Gender Equality. And the Ministry is the Ministry of Health and Social Affairs. And these are the national policy goals. So gender equal division of power and influence, economic gender equality, gender equal education, equal distribution of unpaid housework, that's the part that's working the least, <laughs> gender equal health, and uh, to put an end to men's violence against women. And we have a feminist uh, foreign, a minister of foreign affairs, I don't know about you, uh, but uh, so for, uh, Swedish foreign policy uh, is about obtaining the equality between men and women also internationally. Uh, and in 2009, uh, we had new cultural objectives, and I'll kind of fast forward through that, but uh, one of the objectives is, is to ensure that creativity and diversity and artistic quality should be integral parts of society's development. And funding is the key to that. Anyway, so in <coughs> 2013, um, 18 agencies in Sweden uh, were uh, got the task to uh, develop a gender integration plan in the organization. And now there are set 60 agencies working with gender integration plan in their government agency. Uh, and I just felt I needed to mention this. Uh, in connection with that, a woman called Eva Mike. Uh, wrote a paper for the Swedish Arts Grants Committee, which is uh, the, the uh, funding body that gives independent mu musicians funding. Uh, she wrote a paper on uh, gender integrating the assessment criteria. Uh, so we have an action plan, and it's not in English, but I realized maybe we should translate it into English. And that's about how to integrate uh, gender awareness in the organization, in the decisions, in the meetings, yeah? Uh, and uh, of course the data analysis is really important when we fund. How do we collect the data? And how, what do we say in the applications? And how, what do we make out of that? We uh, created some funding opportunities which were directly um, targeted to gender equality in different ways. Um, yeah, and so, uh, let me see here, yeah, so, uh, well, we never get there, as you said, uh, the minute you kind of stop concentrating on that, something's going to happen and it just goes down the drain, all the work you've been you've done. Uh, and uh, so, for the same reason that gender equality and artistic equality are not in opposition to each other, the same thing goes for diversity, because we need to work a lot more with diversity issues in Sweden and in our Thank you very much. <laughs> Sirius? Yeah. Sirius, would you like to play some more for us?
that Isabel ended with uh, talking about the general diversity issue because that's where I would like to start the discussion. Uh, and I would, I'm very interested in words of the etym etymology of uh, words, where do they actually come from and what do they mean literally. In Swedish, um, especially the term diversity, very popular in EU in general, in EU papers especially, uh, in Swedish, we use the uh, word that literally means multitude, and then we see the alternative to multitude. Yes, please leave there. Uh, the alternative to multitude would be singletude. I'm not sure if that's a word in English, but uh, in Swedish, uh, synonym to singletude is uh, stupidity, and mångfald and enfald. And I'm not sure if this uh, Swedish pun goes. Uh, is transmissible, transferable to English. But I would like to ask the panel, why, why is uh, diversity in gender and in other aspects uh, desirable? Why do we want to achieve this? What do what, what we have to say, Nicola? Well, to start with, if any culture only used 50% uh, of, the, of the gifts and talents of the population, that, that, that would be a daft thing for a culture. I mean, it would, what a curious and weird and, and weak and impoverished culture it would be if it only used 50% of its available pool. Now, that's a gender question, because almost all populations are 50-50. Some are more than in the men, but whatever. But if you tackle one prejudice, if you alert people, the old-fashioned phrase of my generation, of course, was raising consciousness, to the problem that women face, you're actually alerting people to the larger question of diversity. And certainly, and when I was preparing all the statistics back in the 80s about uh, discrimination against women, the person from whom I took my advice was Kofi Argawu, the very distinguished Ghanaian musicologist. And his experience of positive discrimination programs or of discrimination. Um, and one crucial thing, which is that just as you, I think, Karen mentioned, you can't, <laughs> you can't tackle sexism with sexism. You have to have a sense of humor in approaching these issues. And if you can alert people to the prejudices they are not aware they hold, then whether you're talking about um, a prejudice of class or race or gender, each one will alert them to the other, if, if you see. see. So that's my feeling about diversity. You need all of the talents of the people. Paul? The very same point has been made in popular music, whereby Alison Wenham, who was chair of Ames, now chair of Wynn, when she was striving to challenge the underrepresentation of women at senior level, one of the things AIM did back in 2007, and then it was promoted in the years that followed, was to encourage women to put themselves forward to go onto the board. And one of her motivations with that was exactly as she said. She said, if we, if gender equality was, wasn't as great at top level, that would seem to imply that the other inequalities would not seem to be as great. So that's been echoed in popular music exactly the same. Uh, yes, in relation to the issue of why diversity matters, I think especially in the arts, we have to ask ourselves, um, you know, who creates culture? If we see cultural goods, cultures, as something that represents us our, as us as a society, we should represent the whole breadth of whoever, um, um, of um, who the society consists of in terms of gender, in terms of race, in terms of class, ability, age, um, and to use a typical phrase, so on. Um, and I think that's very crucial and something that's not so often discussed. 
because culture is often seen as a luxury or something, you know, something uh, that you just go and enjoy. But actually, I think it plays a very central role in fostering our understanding of us as a society and culture. And therefore, it matters who also makes these cultural goods, who creates them, and who works for the cultural workforce. Yeah, it's a lot. Well, uh, from our point of view, as a government agency, everyone in Sweden pays taxes, and they're all uh, from, you know, working class, whatever. They uh, have, uh, uh, they're, they're maybe second generation immigrants or first generation immigrants. In any case, they're all paying taxes, and so we should be reflecting that in all the work that we do. Well, I could also add one thing that. Uh, Norwegian festival, music festival, that I unfortunately just forgot what the name was, but I spoke to the director. He said that they had, uh, I think for this or even for last year, they had the goal of having a 50-50 representation in artists, in, in composers, and in, in uh, administration. And they reached it. It wasn't that hard, but what you had to do is sometimes you have to make have more discussions of of who should be program or who should be choose, which meant that they actually had to make better choices. They had to discuss things through once more, not just say, oh, let's have this and this and this. It it needed more work, but it also uh, rendered a much higher quality uh, overall in the festival. Uh, those, those, those four answers were all really beautiful, and, and I'd like to add one very cynical um, additional approach, which has been um, quite relevant for Liz Dobson, who I mentioned uh, earlier. So because she's been working in music technology, when she's raised this issue about the dearth of women who are participating in music technology, she's gone to those companies and said, your potential market share, at the moment you are selling to 50% of the possible people who might buy your software or your hardware, and that's worked really well. She has sat in boardrooms and she showed them pictures of girls using this software, sell no, n more kit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, about music and technology. Uh, I mean, also working as a professor there, we, we always ha have to ask uh, how could we look at, uh, I mean, may, as a, you know, attract, uh, yeah. attract, attract <coughs> both women and men. And we have this uh, music and technology program, and they changed their name to music and media, and now there are more <laughs> women. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's interesting. Small things can happen. Small things yeah. matter. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, just to ask, have you collected any audience uh, questions yet? Or do you have any? So Andy's going around while we're talking. I would like to just continue on this um, because we are, uh, this is a Nordic uh, UK uh, collaboration thing. And so I wonder could you draw up any similarities or differences between the Nordic countries and the British countries? Nicola? Well, unfortunately, our government does not have the excellent policies which you describe. Um, and to give one practical example. Um, <coughs> when I went in 1994 to the University of York, which had a very stringent um, uh, process of, of admissions for people in music, rather like the conservatoires with auditions and so on, and the vast majority of our students did not come from privileged backgrounds, and they had not been educated privately at great expense. Now, that same university, the vast majority have been educated privately, and, I mean, not all. This is, and, and come from wealthier homes. Why this change? Because of the political climate in this country, unfortunately, which um, through the 70s and 80s had a music ed education system that was really the envy of the world because of the free provision of instrumental tuition and the youth orchestras, which were provided throughout the country. Um, but our political system is becoming increasingly right wing, regardless of what the party may be called. And most of that has, has fallen away. Um, and it's very, very unfortunate. And so we look with envy at the government policies of your countries. And from uh, Nordic countries, do you have any ideas of what could we see for similar similarities or differences to the UK? Do you have well, any? 
the similarities. I mean, uh, the, it's obvious to me that in the UK you want to work with these questions. Uh, and um, I think something we could learn from you, at least in my agency, we could learn, we could probably get together and talk about data analysis and so on, because we need to, uh, in Sweden, we tend to be maybe a little bit too unacademic about things. And I think we need to kind of um, tweak that up a bit. Uh, I don't know if that was the answer. <laughs> academic in what way? Well, at some, uh, like uh, anal analyzing data and kind of yeah. uh, theorizing a little bit more. There are a few people doing that, but we need to do that a yeah. bit more. Uh, yeah, I, I'm also. It could be also very easy things like uh, the the boss at the uh, Stockholm uh, concert house, Stefan Forsberg, who, who has really tried to do something. And he always put this question in the program group or, or whenever they're doing. So what does this mean to women? What does it mean to men? Always just this question, and it, that opens up then, and, and you you have the eyes open. For you. Mm -hmm. I know Jan Olof Gullor is doing mm -hmm. some work in Stockholm at the moment. He was talking about at the Art of Record Production last year, where he's doing a study looking at the pathways people take to create popular music, and is comparing the success of those going via higher education or those who are going the self-taught route. Now, whether he's including gender in that study, I don't know, but I do know he's about two years into it, so that might produce some interesting results. Yeah, I could also add that I had a former responsibility as being the chairman for the Swedish Society of Composers. And together with Vast, we did a, a very big study on all Swedish concert halls and uh, opera houses and going for uh, uh, gender, for uh, nationality and age of the composers. And how, in which century was this composed. And this data is quite similar to what you have, even though we had 4% of the music was composed by female composers for the season 1450, which of course was a bomb in the, in the Swedish society and all the concert halls, including Stefan Forsberg said, no, that is, must be wrong, this cannot be correct. But no, and it turned out we had missed one concert of 30 minutes that they kept secret from us. So then it came from 3.8 to 3.9 percent. Uh, could we just extend uh, this? Is, we have been that people have been addressing it about also about class and about uh, ethnicity and other aspects. My impression is that 95 percent of the Swede at least Sweden's uh, musical life, including uh, composers, performers, and audience, are white, middle class, middle aged. Uh, preferably men in the composers, but we're getting more even. And do you have any any comments, <coughs> thoughts, ideas about the other diversity issues? And just generally, I mean, I, two two things that I didn't have time to include in the in the talk. But I mean, the first is I'm also totally aware that let's take the 50-50 target. That that's a quite old-fashioned idea of, of gender already, um, which is problematic, and we're kind of aware of that. Yeah. Um, and that the problem around ethnicity in particular is way worse um, yeah. than this, than already a, you know, a significant problem around gender. I, I mean, and I, I don't even know where to begin other than using the same kinds of, same kinds of strategies. Um, yeah, I'm just looking through here because obviously I can't remember the numbers <laughs> by heart. But we, for example, looked at uh, the ethnic background of teaching staff at UK conservatoires, and um, there were less than 28 from a black and minority ethnic background, and 1,317 from a white background. So you can see that that's very little representation. And the admissions figures of conservatoires I found very heartening, uh, very disappointing in that case. Um, so we had in 2011, 2012, and 2013, um, 110 black undergraduate applicants applied, but none were accepted in those years. Um, I mean, that's publicly available data. I'm not disclosing any secrets here, um, because I know that they don't like me to talk about that stuff. Um, but but this, this speaks volumes, I think. 
And there's lots more data, of course, that we can draw on. Um, another point, I think, in relation to ethnic diversity and at least Western art music or so-called classical music is that we also have to distinguish between different groups. I think um, uh, what in the US is called East Asians, um, or here East Asians and US Asians, um, uh, they, are, they tend to be quite well represented as an ethnic group. So there's differences amongst ethnic groups. And I think that's quite important to highlight as well. That's not to say uh, that uh, East Asians are treated equally at all, and there are also issues around that, I think, but that's to highlight that you know, ethnic minorities aren't just one same group, in the same way that women or men aren't just one same group. Yeah. And you were also, Nicola was also addressing the, the income, and, uh, because both ethnicity and uh, gender are usually quite visible in people, but uh, the class and how wealthy you are uh, is not always that visible until you start speaking. And uh, so the question is, do you have to be wealthy or do you have to have wealthy parents in order to become a musician? Well, certainly in this country, um, it is very expensive nowadays to train to be a musician. And also the, the provision that we have in terms of scholarships and facilities is actually quite small for our population. We, we have nine conservatoires in, in the UK. Now Finland, because <coughs> we're being Nordic, I'm citing Finland. Finland, which has a very small population compared to the UK, has 11 conservatoires uh, and, a, and a program of music schools that feeds into them. So that the provision of music education is, is far superior. And therefore, to me, it's sort of no wonder that there's a very healthy musical culture in, in Finland. Of all, you know, folk music as well as classical music and so on. And it's not, not just one genre. And in Sweden and the Nordic countries, do you, do you have to be wealthy or do you have need to wealthy parents in order to become a composer or a musician? I mean, we have our famous Kulturskola, yes. <laughs> which is not uh, expensive. So, so maybe not. Maybe not, not but of course extent. it's easier if you, if, if your parents. Yes, of course. If you have interested parents, yeah. uh, you will or get you further. <laughs> but yeah. that would go further. Yeah. Christina um, and then Paula. Yeah, I just wanted to make a, a point in relation to class. What I think is also very important, and I'm drawing here on a study of Anna Bull, who is a sociologist at Portsmouth University, who conducted research on um, uh, young people from diverse socio uh, socioeconomic backgrounds uh, uh, pursuing music education in the UK very recently. And she's shown that it's not the income only that matters or the wealth of your family, uh, but really the culture. Uh, who feels a sense of belonging when they go to a concert hall, when they go to youth orchestra and so on. Um, a lot of young people who came from so-called musical families reported that they were kind of raised listening to classical music, going to concerts, and you can kind of see from there that they might feel more at ease in a certain environment and make it further. And I think that's very important too to also talk about the cultural dimension, because it could be a bit of an easy way out to say, oh sorry, you just can't afford it, so we're not going to change anything, because that's something one could change as well, to make the di more diverse range of people feel comfortable in a certain environment. Just to give a popular music perspective on what Nicola was saying, I mean, in, in the opposite way, there's been an explosion of degrees in popular music. Um, and I teach at the London College of Music at the University of West London, and that's just one of many that is, you know, offering very interesting courses. But the majority of students, because of the fees, they're middle class, you know. Or, and increasingly in, in the, in the postgrads, they're, they're students coming from abroad. So I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing at all any working class kids coming through. And that shows actually, a, a, you know, from my perspective, it shows a people, we, we give uh, money to collaborative projects, which means that you have to make an application, and you have to be able to write the application. And we don't really, we don't demand that you write particularly complicated, we, we ask questions that you answer, it's, it's simple. But just for some people, the idea of making an application to a Swedish government agency is too much. I mean, they just they they don't expect that their application is going to be taken seriously. Unfortunately, uh, so that's a big problem. The way you do it. Uh, we have uh, we have got uh, three questions from the audience. Do we have any more questions from the audience coming up? Now that you have been very concise. Uh, very good question came here. 
A very prominent argument against, for example, having a gender balanced concert program is that it would mean to choose pieces in accordance to gender balance and not quality of the pieces. How can this argument be countered and how should one respond to this argument? Aaron. Can, I, I really want a chance to answer yes. this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I wrote a little something about this. Um, our, our record label target, mm -hmm. and um, okay. embarrassingly, um, my former head of department, um, John Bryan, <laughs> asked this question of me. He said, "You know, uh, what's, how do you how do you answer the question of does this cut down on the number of opportunities for male composers, and isn't that unfair?" Um, and uh, no, it's not unfair. Is the answer to that question? There should be fewer opportunities for people who look like me. That's, I mean, like, I have absolutely no problem saying that, that if we accept that there are limited resources and limited opportunities in our field, and we want those opportunities to be divided more equally, then by definition, there need to be fewer that go to people like me. The end. Yes, um, I was just going to read something from this uh, London Review of Books, the current issue, where uh, there's a great article by the Irish novelist Anne Enright, and she says, the argument about excellence, that women's work just isn't good enough, is incredibly hurtful, given that there is so much mediocre work by men around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I have so frequently had to, you know, been asked to counter the argument, well, you know, we don't program this music because it's not good enough. Or, that, that's why I use the word ignorance in my talk. It is our duty, all of us, to make people aware of what wonderful work there is, which they don't know. I mean, on the whole, I find that when um, an impresario, and usually a male one, says, I, I can only program like this because there isn't good enough work, this person does not know the repertoire of what is available. That, I, I think that's important. I, I also think that by setting those kinds of targets, you know, we, um, Lisa, my, my colleague and my predecessor in, in my current role, um, gave this amazing talk in a similar kind of situation in Australia a couple of weeks ago. And she talks about this as being about luck and very much kind of structural luck. And one of the reasons why she has had the opportunity to become the composer who she is is because she had opportunities to develop as composer and write big orchestra pieces and write large ensemble pieces. And we have to construct those opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. It isn't enough to just say, you know, well, it isn't just about quality. It is about no, actually absolutely. generating that quality. Yeah. Um, if I may add something myself, one of the things we can do is also like the current says help, because either it comes, whether it comes to uh, female composers or it's become living Swedish or Norwegian or Danish composers, uh, when you ask the general uh, concert hall boss, they knew very, very few of these. So if you give them a list, okay, here's 200 uh, Swedish female composers, uh, living and dead, uh, just pick five of them. <laughs> and you know, of course, no one can know 200 composers and their music, but they can at least know 20. You put them on all this. Yeah, and it's the same on, on a, a music college with repertoire. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we have had a project now trying to, to increase music by women composers into the e education. And it's a, a, a great job then to find repertoire and, but I mean if everyone find, finds one piece, yeah. then, then it will be uh, many pieces. <coughs> So, but for example, yeah. in, in our postgraduate series this year, all of the class, all of the music that I'm teaching yeah. in our music, since music in the 21st century yeah. series is all women. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. I think the attitudes we're highlighting here, or the issues we're highlighting here, they have a long tail. Because historically, in all cultural fields, creative genius is gendered masculine. And because of that, that still carries on. So that's why we don't look. Absolutely. Because it is the, and um, Mayor Emma Hugh, Mayhew um, coined a wonderful phrase uh, back in 2004 in a publication with regards to music produ uh, production, but she talked about patriarchal assumptions. And whenever it comes to creativity, and certainly controlling creativity through music production, those patriarchal as assumptions determine how, 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 you know, our attitude towards women who produce mm -hmm. and, or, or, and or create, and therefore stop us looking. 
we had a good comment from the audience here. Uh, isn't that there? How? Sorry, I'm not reading too well. Uh, isn't there a natural assumption that there will be a reduction in talent uh, if the, whenever the notion of diversity is introduced? That you will actually take out the good music and then put in the diversity instead. And it feels like often when you bring this up, uh, you assume that you will take in lesser good people because of diversity. Do you have a comment? Yes. Yeah, I think this links to quite widespread assumptions in our culture that somehow art is, has to be stripped from everything that is social. So once we intervene with protests and talk about diversity, it's no longer pure and fine art. And this ties into these ideas of who the genius is. I think a lot of us imagine this man working in the garret, and it is white men often in our imagination. Um, and, and that's something that needs to be challenged, because we know that art is as social as any other human activity that we engage with, yeah, because it is a human activity. Um, so this is how I'd explain it. I'm not sure that I have you know, all the means to argue against it, but I think at least that can help us understand why that assumption exists, that somehow talent and diversity are opposed of quality and diversity. And we had another addressing uh, more uh, administration. How can staff diversity issues at conservatoires be addressed? Be addressed? And I could start that uh, comment by when uh, Swedish Society of Composers did uh, three consecutive uh, uh, projects on gender diversity because we tried to figure out why is uh, composers uh, compo composition necessarily <coughs> a very male activity? What and. Uh, why is, were there so many male composers? And we went down to the conservatoires and asked them about this, and all six conservatoires, as are in Sweden, said, we don't have this problem, because we only see uh, to quality and not to gender. And then we replied that, but you don't have one single female mm -hmm. composer teacher in Sweden. How long ago? This was in 2009, I think. I started then. So then yeah. we got more professors. <laughs> and now, I'm not sure about the figures. And no. since we are three, uh, we are three now. Okay. Yeah. So it's but someone has to care for it. <laughs> uh, that uh, when I mean you can't. Uh, you we have our jobs, but but when it, but when there is a new a new job, you, someone has to care about that uh, that yeah. you change something. Yeah. And that's not always the the case, I would say. And how about the compo composing in the UK? Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I think maybe I'd answer it from the other way around. And, and I see in our department, so we have four composers working in kind of acoustic music with the 50-50 gender division between those four. And I see that in the applications for students. I definitely see that there are people who have clearly targeted wanting to come study with Lisa or to come study with, with Mary, and I think it's had an impact on the balance of our, of our student body. Um, so, I mean, I can simply say that it, it works, that, that when you do target that kind of hiring um, and have those kind of strong models, that it does filter down into, into the student body. Yeah, I just... Oh, sorry. Actually, I can support what Eric's saying. Can you speak a little louder, please? I'm so sorry. Um, Gary Carpenter, um, apart from being a pastor, I also teach at the Royal Northern College of Music and at the Royal Academy of Music, but in Manchester, where for the last year, two years we've had two out of our six composition staff for women, we have seen an increase in the number of women applicants. So we're now running at 39% women. The department has over 42. 60% uh, of my teaching levels are women. Um, and I do attribute this to the fact that it is clearly become a more generally complex. I mean, it's not mm. reached by the quality, so there's no need to press it or not, but it does feel in support of what Aaron is saying. Yes, <coughs> On the other hand, I spoke to Helena Tulve uh, in uh, Estonia, Tallinn, a teacher there, and they have almost only girls, young women. <laughs> and where, where did the men go? They, they have gone to computer or somewhere where they earn more money. So that's <laughs> <laughs> can I just, uh, we have one follow-up question on this, and also how can student diversity inequality 
which covers also both gender, ethnic, and socioeconomic background be readdressed. Uh, well, you had a question, sorry. Well, it's sort of like uh, you have targeted time of music and, and teaching a civil academy uh, and studying in the United States. I think uh, the whole question of, sort of role model, and this I mean because I've been on a lot of uh, application boards, would be exciting and, and what the situation is in Finland at the moment, be exciting it. Uh, I'm really asking myself when we are talking about role models nowadays, that this is a very specific case. If we are really talking about composers, we have not really been talking about the whole classical music field as a big package, but we are sort of really talking it from a sort of composition point of view. In fact, I mean, I mean, we are talking about very complex ecosystems, and sort of taking out one thing from a complex ecosystem doesn't really tell everything. Uh, and uh, but uh, when I'm looking at, for example, uh, nowadays at, at this year's Sibelius Academy. A very strong, uh, uh, I could say that 60 to 70 percent of the accepted students were in fact female. Uh, the only where we nearly had full male panels were composition, jazz, and music electronics. But in a lot of other fields, we nearly had full female panels. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, and, and for example, I'm thinking about uh, a role model. If we are looking at uh, orchestras, most often their, their orchestras, uh, when they do concertos, and we talk about that concertos, where you don't really define that it has to be a female or male who plays that. Uh, most cases, for example, radio orchestra in, in Sweden is nearly 100% male service this year. But I'm, and, and with Finland is a bit less, so we are doing a little bit better. Uh, but, but in relation, and, and then we talk about the dead, dead uh, but then the role models of that, for example, those who got accepted to the civil academy playing violin, of 15, there was one male and 14 women. And the, the name of the male happened to be Sarastu. Uh, so, uh, so, so we are talking about some really other things that are sort of happening simultaneously on different levels, on things. But when you're talking about a composer, the role model for a composer, when you are young, you're usually excited about the dead composers. We're talking about, so that's somebody who's not tweeting and not sending emails and things like that, doesn't have a web presence. What is the role model for a composer today when they start and they usually apply, they don't really know who will be teaching them, they like, like beautiful music by their composers, they come to the university and they start to realize that their composers are alive. Yes, so this is a very different trick. True. Uh, one more. Yes. Yeah, no, um, for, one first, I think it was uh, sure. Christina. Um, I just wanted uh, to add in terms of, I think the issue of role models is important, and in terms of conservatoire admissions, um, I have not conducted a review of admissions practices at UK conservatoires, um, but I think generally, as for orchestras as well, blind auditions could really have make a difference, for example. Um, um, because we know that that has made a massive difference in US orchestras already. So that would be my suggestion. I'm, I'm just, I'm really struck by um, the comments about the waves um, and you, the, the festival in 72 and um, I, I had a really interesting conversation with Lisa Colton who's another colleague of mine who heads our music, gender and identity group, uh, research group and she, one of the things she said to me was that there have always been prominent women musicians and female composers, always, across Western musical history, and they get written out of history. And that's the part that I'm really concerned about, that you know, we, we keep talking about providing these opportunities or there are people who are, who are active and who are very talented, and, but, but also creating those models that, that stick and that stay in the history books and that are, I don't know, iconic kind of figures, that that's crucial. So I was so just going to say it's uh, not just staff sorry. conservatoires, but if you look at the library holdings and if you look at the course content, mm -hmm. one of the things that I find depressing mm -hmm. is that in most degree courses I've looked at, uh, if there's a woman on the staff, she may well be using examples of music composed by women as well as by men. And very, very few of the male staff are doing that. I mean, I must have counted countless courses on string quartets and specifically on Shostakovich string quartets and never on the Elizabeth McConkie quartets. That's written out history. Uh, we've got another very good question to maybe wrap this up uh, and add 
addressing what we spoke about earlier. So, how can we help conservatoires and other gatekeepers, such as festivals, directors, and other people, understand the responsibility in creating diversity, <coughs> such as the intake of students at concert, conservatoires and similar? How can we help uh, them achieving <laughs> our goals, these goals? Sorry, can I just, can yes. I answer that? Um, actually, um, I'm Hannah Kendall, I'm one of the directors at London Music Masters, um, as well as a composer. And um, we're trying to tackle the issues of um, diversity and inclusion um, in the industry, um, but more specifically inclusion, which is including um, people who might not otherwise participate in classical music, because diversity is a reality, we live in a diverse world. So it's actually whether we're choosing to include people within our activities. And what we're doing is, is that we are creating an inclusion index where we're inviting all organisations across the industry to um, to join the index and where they would mark and check how inclusive their organisations are being. Um, and so actually we have them at the seminar right now, which um, so that the match, but where um, the chief executives and the leaders of arts organisations are um, we're providing training on the notions of unconscious bias and why it is that we are excluding people from our activities. And we're asking those organisations to, to make those statistics um, so that we know who is working in our industry, who the role models are, who the people are who are coming up through the industry. So, you know, in a generation's time, we're still not having the same conversations. We actually know the statistics and we know the barriers and we know how to combat them. Um, and so I suppose we're in the pilot stage and this is sort of a plug to any organisation who might want to join us because we think you know, all of this is really important and, um, and what we're doing is we're not creating, recreating the wheel, we're just taking a model from Stonewall um, um, which um, works specifically with um, LGBTQ um, checks and markers. We're doing things that other industries are already doing but we're just so far behind that we're having to catch up with ourselves. Thank you very much. I would like to wrap this whole uh, thing up uh, by asking the, the panels uh, the first, the same thing I asked when we started. What did we achieve today? What have we achieved by discussing this uh, for 90 minutes? Or is it something that you remember specifically uh, from the speaks? Uh, who would like to start? Or should I just point at you? <laughs> okay. Corin, where um, to start? I, I'm now thinking of perhaps we have to open up <laughs> when talking about because uh, I feel often contemporary music we feel a bit threatened by all the commercial music and by, and, and perhaps we should we should open up in in taking in other genres and mix more and uh, I don't know opening yes. up yeah. thank you. Paula. Bring back maintenance grants mm. uh, <laughs> for students of working class backgrounds and get rid of tuition fees for them as well. Very good. Uh, well, I agree with Kari and with you too. But, uh, I mean, well, it doesn't really apply to Sweden actually. Uh, but, uh, yeah, one thing I came to think of now is we're talking about role models and about focusing on women as. Uh, the, the female group being the one that needs to be helped up. But uh, actually, at the same time, you need to work with the male identity as a, a role model. There's a festival here called Being a Man, and I think that's an important part of the whole issue, actually. Apart from, um, we do work a lot with including other kind of music styles. I hate talking about genres because that all, that's also a way of locking people into different, like assuming that everyone who does hip hop is of a cert, has a certain socio-economic background. It isn't really the case, yeah. and that contemporary music is only white people. There are a lot of really good Arab uh, people that we in collaborative projects that do live electronics and really interesting exchanges. So, but yeah, we need to expand our <coughs> definition of who we can fund. Yeah. Yeah. Aaron? Um, 
The Title IX um, legislation in the U.S., which was passed in 1974, made it illegal to use federal funding for any program that didn't provide equal opportunities for both genders. And um, in sports, in particular, um, that went from about 300,000 girls participating in interscholastic sports in 1974 to 3.1 million now. Um, and so my, my kind of final, my final thought is that it's kind of connected to your job, which is um, money. Um, and at a certain point, the organizations that give money have to set those targets and make it a rule um, that, 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 we have to, that we have to give money only to organizations that are meeting these gender targets. Yes, I think following on from the pre previous speakers, money, or to put it slightly different, um, and I've said that before, uh, Hannah has certainly heard that a couple of times, um, inequalities are a structural issue, they are a wider issue, and they also need wider solutions and not individual solutions. So structural solutions like uh, leg legislation are important and uh, they need to be there to tackle those issues. I would agree completely, but never forget that every individual can make a difference. So they have to be strategic <laughs> solutions. But time and again I've seen and I've attempted to live my life by this, that if you speak up and if you find the right person to speak to, whatever else it may be, one person can make a difference. And you can maybe open the door for someone or maybe you can change the attitude of someone's programming or whatever else it may be. Everyone here can make a difference. Thank you very much for this famous last word. Uh, you can, if you feel like, because this I feel like uh, you should continue this discussion, it can be uh, continued in the Skylon bar, which is the unofficial uh, <coughs> bar for the unofficial festival bar, uh, where you can are most welcome to continue to talk about this. At 6.45, there will be a glorious inauguration of this festival in the Chlorbrook <coughs> room over there. And I would like to give a, a serious and current inquest uh, the last uh, word of this glorious debate. Thank <laughs> you.